in physics, and we also have our principal master teacher, Charles. Um, as this is a, a co collaborative project, um, Lukang and Charles will be sharing with you a little uh, kind of like duet. <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Lu Kang. Uh, I'm from ETD. Uh, together with Charles and my colleague uh, Yumi, we are going to present this to you. So, uh, first and foremost, I just like to say that this is a project that is uh, pretty much uh, ground up. Okay, I think that uh, it would be good if, let's say at the end of the presentation, you see that there's any way to support this project and other projects like ours in a top-down manner. I think that would be fantastic. Okay, let, let me just start off by saying that uh, we were very inspired by what our DG has said in uh, 2009 about teacher leadership. And that is why this is one of the reasons why we align ourselves to what uh, DG said about uh, as leaders, we design active learning in the classroom. Uh, another aspect of teacher leadership is we also want to harness the experts around the world as well as in our fraternity so that we as teachers are learners. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the world of geostationary satellites. Uh, now, actually, we, uh, when we did this project, we need to hang the project in an inquiry framework. And we like to give credit to Dr. Pun Chiu Ling's uh, Three Seas with a Pie. Uh, Three Seas with a Pie is, uh, is actually a Singapore-born uh, inquiry framework, which we are very proud of. I think the first C stands for capturing interest. And we want to capture interest through uh, a news, uh, an article, which I think I'd like to refer you to an article on uh, uh, Singapore's uh, first geostationary satellite. So uh, that's how we want to capture interest with the students, something that is uh, uh, relevant to their world. Um, so you refer to the, this little article from NLB, published in January 2011. We will normally say that, uh, uh, we ask the student, have you actually wondered whether Singapore has our own geostationary satellite. And going forward, uh, which year actually was it launched? And what is it for? For weather forecasting, for communication. And uh, the article actually shows that it's in 1998 that Singapore actually Singtel launched together with uh, the uh, uh, Taiwan uh, a joint venture. And now uh, uh, Singapore has launched our own very own in the year 2011. Right? So you need to capture interest of the students. Because this simulation, an ICT simulation, can only be part of the inquiry framework. After capturing the interest, it sits in, uh, it sits in, in the second part, and that is constructing understanding. And constructing understanding, uh, according to Pun Chuling, Dr. Pun Chuling, has a PIE, uh, PIE, PIE, no, 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 not the expressway, right? Okay. Uh, is uh, uh, prepared to investigate, investigate and explain. So later on, uh, as, uh, when I hand over to Lu Kang, it will show the PIE part of the inquiry framework, the constructing understanding. And finally, of course, is the, is the last C, that is consolidating understanding. So uh, let me now uh, just show you the little capturing interest on the geostationary satellite. Of course, it's good to uh, engage the student and ask them, as you look at this simulation, what's so special about this uh, geostationary satellite? It's to evoke the interest, to foster curiosity and imagination. Right? So go back to the slide. So very quickly, uh, we just said uh, this, uh, what actually we have done is the inquiry cycle, because inquiry, uh, there are five essential features according to CPDD framework. We need to have a scientifically oriented question. We need to have evidence, uh, collecting our data as evidence. Let them make meaning of the uh, uh, data to analysis, formulating the explanation and communicating. So uh, we, we actually chose this topic, geostationary satellite, why do, we, why do we use simulation rather than everyday materials and model? And actually, uh, if we refer to page 45, uh, this is the handbook that was launched last year. This, this uh, whole uh, uh, satellite uh, model simulation is, can be found in page 45 as part of ICT integrated physics curriculum. And uh, we, if you turn over to the next page 46, there's the pedagogical affordances of technology in physics instruction on page 46. And under page 46, the table 4.7, uh, the multimedia right below, uh, use of technology specific, multimedia animation, simulation, uh, this is the what, right? this is the what. Uh, the way is a curriculum. I think it's important that ICT is supporting, mediating curriculum rather than driving curriculum. So the curriculum is uh, uh, the where, and finally, uh, the pedagogical affordances, there's a why and how. And why and how is actually captured under learning is experiential because it involves meaning making 
through visualization and modeling and simulation. So uh, this is an important piece of information to anchor our learning in this uh, simulation of constructing a deep understanding. Because uh, we, in the 21st century, teacher is not just the only source of knowledge. Because classroom of today is becoming more and more open. Because actually learning can be via internet. That's why probably in this lesson, uh, the teacher will probably have to direct the students to look for internet and look for this question, does Singapore have our own very own geostationary satellite? And where, where are we now in this journey of communication satellites and weather satellites? So with that, I hand over to Lo Kang to bring, bring you to the second C after capturing interest. And now it's a constructing understanding. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so as you can see in this applet, uh, we have designed the applet in consultation with the school teachers as well as the student. And these are some of the valuable feedback. Uh, this, this is the end product. So you can see if you can uh, see this, uh, if I can zoom in quickly, you can see that this is actually roughly the map around where Singapore is because it's a Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, what we did is we, uh, we situate the learning uh, on Singapore because we created this simulation and we are so lucky that we are around the equator. So it will be quite easy to refer uh, geostationary orbits to Singapore co uh, context. And we designed uh, different aspects of it uh, where we can actually now also look at other geostationary orbits. So this is an orbit, if you can see down here at the bottom, this is a geostationary around uh, near Amer America continent. So we can design different scenarios. So students do not just, like a YouTube video, they just see one particular way of geostationary orbit, and then they have to make sense of it. Here, the student can actually be playing with it, panning around, zooming in and looking at how the, the globe is, uh, is uh, in reference to the physics concept here. Uh, we also design different situations where the orbit is a little bit faster, and then we build in real physics um, paths, uh, you know, in, in order to to model the, the real world. So we, we found that uh, through discussion with the teachers, they say, oh, actually it would be quite good if you can actually uh, look at something which is uh, geostationary. Uh, this is a work in progress uh, because uh, this, is a, this is a ground up thing. So you can see that it has just hung, so I'm not going to elaborate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> What we did with the school was a more stable version because the, the product that we use is a researcher grade. It's not commercial, so it, it's going to have bugs. But we can work around it because we can still release a very useful curriculum for free for anybody in the world to use. Okay. Okay, this slide actually shows that beyond inquiry is the fostering of a scientifically literate learner in our students. So in line PISA, we have chosen geostationary satellite because it's impossible to bring the whole satellite to the classroom. So we are at the same time, we want them to be aware of the third point, how science and technology shape our material, intellectual and cultural environment. I think that's important. We want them to see beyond learning in the school, uh, out there in the world. So uh, uh, the next few slides will actually showcase how Lukang uses this to foster uh, inquiry, learning. That's the second point as well as evidence-based conclusions about science-related issues. If this has been come up, if this thing has come up earlier, Galileo will not have been put under house arrest. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, in the Energy Award, uh, we, we won, just to answer the question, we won 5,000. Uh, but what I'm arguing for is actually this is a fundamental breakthrough. We should be 8,000, but it's okay. <laughs> Because what we have done is we have created active learning previously not possible. I mean, imagine in a typical classroom today, you just go to any school, uh, in, in the JC context of course, the, the student will be basically learning from text and, and, and diagrams and maybe at best a YouTube, you know. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is, is really, uh, it's a fundamental change. Lah, okay? So now students, if you can see from here, this is an artifact of an actual student's work. So the students are now not just regurgitating or memorizing facts. They are actually behaving like scientists. Okay? Mm. They are looking at the simulation, making reasonable assumptions about it, and then coming up with possible reasons why it is uh, considered as a geostationary orbit, which is what we are trying to do here. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to show you, run you through the other three simulations. There's a total, uh, total of four of them. These are all built using the uh, open source uh, research researchers' work uh, called the open source physics. Okay, so down here, we actually allow the students to, uh, like a scientist, uh, draw, or, or, okay, create a mess, okay, and then from here, they can visualize 
invisible concepts. I'm not going to explain to you the concept, uh, but essentially these are ideas which have no uh, physical form. They are just uh, you know, concepts of uh, fields and all that, strength, potential. So what we've done is we have actually married all these concepts into a coherent environment where students can now be the leader in their own investigation. They do not need to take the teacher's word for it. They do not need to take the textbook answer for accuracy. They can now actually do uh, inquiry on this environment and find out for themselves what are, how are these concepts going to make sense in physics. So we actually built it such that uh, when you come here, we put a test mess here. So what is the effects of gravity? I mean, to a layman, you know, it's, to a physics student, it's like, wow, this is mind-boggling. So actually, gravity has an effect of pulling uh, other masses. So this is what we have done. And then we have coupled with other scientific representations to allow students to make sense, uh, which is on, on these uh, bars at the, at the right. And in our curriculum outcome, uh, in our curriculum syllabus, we actually require the student to understand a two mass system. So you can see as I dynamically pull the mass, increases the mass of the second object, the, the scientific, the invisible concepts are all interacting uh, on displaying in real time. What actually this concept mean? And I can come here and pull the, pull the mass, okay? And then I can look at how the forces are being uh, affected. At the same time, I can also just play and observe the changes. So this will give a very intuitive sense of physics to the student, which normally they would have difficulty uh, making sense of. Now, uh, the other feature, which is, uh, this, is uh, this is one of the, the newer stuff, but this is essentially a data analysis tool. So what it does is students are no longer, they, they can actually now look at the data and then do analysis on it so that they have a deeper understanding rather than uh, memorizing. Okay, this is the third applet. Okay, we call combinal models. In, in different uh, circles, it's called differently, but essentially this is to allow the students. So now, imagine if a student have no idea what is this term called escape velocity. So now the student can actually key in different values, okay? Make a prediction, uh, and then from here observe what happens. Oh, I got to put it near the Earth, huh? Okay, so I put it near Earth, the Earth's surface. I key in negative 12,000 for the speed of the projectile to be ejected from the surface. And the student can now observe as if like they are uh, in outer space. What is the effects of this mass because of the, the velocity that was given initially? So you can see that it travels and then it keeps on going to this other smaller object. Uh, unfortunately, because this is drawn in real scale, meaning this is really in proportion to the radius and the actual distances between uh, Earth and Moon, that's why the teacher always complains. Can you make it bigger? I say, I can't because really the world is, is really that far apart, you know, the, the Moon and the Earth. So this is a, a struggle that we have, okay? Uh, this one will be the last simulation. Uh, this one is... So this one is another simulation uh, also by the open source physics community. So here the student actually can select a different planet and click play. And this is all done in 3D. So it's not your, your typical uh, 2D plane kind of uh, view. So here a student can reorientate and then make sense of the planets. So my contribution as a physics teacher was I took all the various pictures from, the, from Wikipedia and I make it, I add it into the model so that uh, it is more realistic. I also added the features of making all the planets move at the same time. Because the original uh, simulation done by the professor uh, in the US only sees uh, two planets at one time moving. So uh, there was some customization that we have done on our end. Okay. Okay, so this is, uh, so what I'm arguing again is, uh, I'm arguing for uh, 8K thingy, it's a fundamental breakthrough. <laughs> okay. These are the four simulations. <laughs> this is the simulations, okay? So what we have done is we have actually customized to the Singapore syllabus, okay? And uh, through, how are we customizing? It's, uh, it's, it's a very simple process. I just go down to school and I talk to the students and the teachers and I get feedback and then I come back and I try to um, improve the simulations. Mm. Okay, uh, these are all done uh, using actual astronomical data. So they are not masa masa, you know, you know and it, what they call the... Uh, animations. Uh, these are simulations. So it's a different uh, gender of it. Now the process is, uh, we are, this is a research validated. Okay, 
okay, because they are, they are actually physics professors looking at them. So I also submit these models to the open source physics library. And these professors actually take the time to look at the models to see that they are actually scientifically uh, accurate in representation. Uh, it is completely free. Anybody can use it and uh, with the main aim of benefiting uh, humankind. <laughs> Thank you, Lukang. I think definitely we are more mission-driven than money-driven, right? So, <laughs> so actually when we do this, it's really to fulfill the mission of bringing the learning of physics to the, to the students. Now, having said that, I think what we have done uh, in this simulation, normally when I, uh, when I coach the ICT mentors, I always ask them three questions. Is, is what you're doing more e effective than the non-ICT? Because there's a place on ICT, there's a place for non-ICT, right? And not only that, is it more effective? That's the first question. Is it more efficient? Generally, is huh? generally is it more efficient? And finally, this is a very special one, and it fulfills the last E, which is quite difficult. Is it more economical? I think it's free. Okay, so definitely more economical uh, than all those hands-on uh, apparatus that we used to do. Now let me now move on to the last part, and that is impact. I think, as I said just now, uh, this is just a, a, a simulation that hangs on the inquiry framework to foster science literacy. And we want learners as a students to become scientists. But the beautiful thing about this is actually inquiry-centric, where we put the whole IBL, inquiry-based learning, into the hands of ordinary students, not just in Singapore, but all over the world. I think he has put his simulation on Wikipedia too. I'm very proud of him. Right? <laughs> and that's why he's, in, he's, a, he's a very strategic member in my physics subject chapter core team. Because this year, the physics subject chapter core team strategic focus is really to uh, do an ICT integrated curriculum in line with the LCMS that is coming up and also to foster connectivity with the Gen Y, Gen y teachers. Huh? I'm a baby boomer, so I need a Gen Y, no, Gen X, right? Uh, Gen X <laughs> to, be, to, to be my bridge, okay, to the Gen Y. So, of course, I need a harness. As I say, I'm one person who believes in teacher leadership. Teacher leadership is about knowledgeable others. I would like to affirm him as definitely more knowledgeable than me in ICT simulation. So this is really the learners and scientists. And going forward, we want teachers, empowering teachers as curriculum designers and in the area of computer models. So all this journal publication, local conference, overseas conference, is a way of a platform to enthuse and our teachers out there and to invite them to be our collaborative learners and also collaborative designers so that together we can harness the power of collective wisdom to create more computer, gen uh, uh, computer models. Uh, not, not, not so much for the energy, but really for the mission-driven uh, professionalism. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the energy of war, I need to argue for scalability. So um, I just give you a flavor of it. Uh, there are currently about maybe 2,000 plus uh, curriculum models, uh, simulation models that we can actually customize. So I've actually looked at 65 of them, uh, and I share them freely on the blog. So anybody can just download and use it uh, in their classroom. So talking about scalability, another, para another way of looking at it is um, I have actually enthused my colleagues uh, in school. So this one is actually done as a sec three curriculum. This is a, a, a lead teacher in NJC teaching the sec three students. So we use the different models to, to, to address the different learning problems. So this one was about vernier caliper me measurements. Uh. Okay, and uh, I also have colleagues in ETD that are doing uh, primary school curriculum. They look at some of the applets that are available and then they customize it to primary four. Okay. This is a, like a, a scenario where there's a crane and then it drops a ball and then they look at how, what's the velocity at which it hits the building, mm. stuff like that. Okay, so sustainability, uh, so we started off with teacher leadership, I'd like to end with teacher leadership. <laughs> this is a conceptual framework that I came up with to allow the audience to understand, or, or the readers uh, of the Energy Award, to understand how we came about to do what we did. So essentially, uh, we took charge of uh, the actual scaling. And, and um, it is sustainable because we have actually gone all out to impact uh, curriculum and schools. So you can see on this side, roughly in the red circle, uh, I have roughly touched on the uh, AST community, the CBDD, ETD uh, community, and we have put our lesson actually in EduMall as well. Uh, and I'm also leading a project in EduLab. Uh, I have published in journal papers regarding the same uh, things that I've been doing. And like what Charles has been saying, uh, I've also conducted, I've also gone for conferences to share with the larger uh, physics educators. And at the same time, how we have impacted the world is we have put up, we have actually animated some of the simulations into animations 
so that this can be can serve as a very vivid way of looking at the physics concept through the Wikipedia. So you can just do a quick search, and you can probably find some of these simulations uh, in animated forms. Okay. okay. To end our presentation, I thought it's good to say that uh, what is a geostationary satellite? How high is it? Huh? Uh, so you find that you go to the internet is 35,786 kilometers. That's about 36,000 kilometers above the equator. And the uh, orbital velocity of this satellite is 3,000 meters per second. And of course, it takes one day. That's why it's called geostationary satellite. Now, relative to our MOE building, MOE, MOE building is 82.73 meters high. So I'm going to visualize just a thought experiment. How high is that geostationary satellite? If you take this value divided by that value, um, it goes up to 430,000 times the height of MOE building. So try to visualize 400, 400 MOE building times 1,000. Uh, that is the height of the geostationary satellite that we are enjoying all the communications. Uh, they are going to be in Olympic very soon, right, in June, and also all the weather forecasting. So we want to give uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the honor to those who actually put in a lot of hard work in science and technology to invent this beautiful uh, science and technology invention for the benefit of all mankind. Like what you say. <laughs> so we end our presentation. Uh, basically, it's a three C capturing interest. I hope we have captured your interest using the article. I hope we actually use this simulation to construct understanding. Well, because of time constraint, that's why it's a bit teacher centric, not student centric. Uh, then, uh, then the last one is uh, we hope that we have consolidated our learning by appreciating how high the geostationary satellite relative to MOE building. With that, thank you very much.